And since um, many of you wanted to hear more about the topic, um, including those people that I asked, your quotes are also featured in this presentation. So um, let's get started. I'm just redoing the presentation that I did for the students this morning. Okay, who remembers this? Wasn't this fun? <laughs> I think I was in primary school when this came out. And I read like maybe book one to ten or so. Uh, well, I just checked and it turns out they have 27. But they have like book 27 now. So this was, I think it's like the repository for all the ghost stories that you've you can hear in Singapore. Um, I think you and I probably knew more about ghosts in Singapore than this, um, than, you know, from what family members or friends told me. And I think it's kind of interesting. Like you see on book 27, they write their wokeism. Like what has, does that have to do with ghosts, right? Um, I don't know. I have to get the book and read it. <laughs> Okay. So what I'll cover in this presentation, I'm going to talk about what is pantang, what is petua. So there'll be lots of Malay terms in here, but I'll just try to translate as I go along. Okay, so pantang means like things that you should not do, taboos, and petua are like tips or the things that you should do. Then we have sihir. So sihir can be good sihir or bad sihir which in English you would say, you know, uh, white magic or black magic. Um, things like barang, hanta barang, literally to send things. Uh, this means to cast a spell on someone or to use a potion. Uh, barang keras, literally hard things. Uh, that means something that has some magic attached to it. Okay, hantu is like our catch-all term for all supernatural entities. So I'm going to cover... Um, the pelaris or penglaris, which is uh, different ways to kind of make your business prosper. Jin, um, which are like a entity that lives in a parallel existence to humans. And Toyo, which is an entity that is known to cause mischief. And it does like, you know, naughty things like steal other people's money. Um, I'll talk about spirits. Um, so one example is orang bunian which is a kind of, I think like forest people, you know, they live in some parallel universe as well. So like, for example, you know, like, I think it's a little bit like the fairies in like Western um, Western folklore because they usually live in the forest or somewhere in nature. And then if uh, there are accounts of like people that disappear because they eat, they disappear into the Orang Bunian's um, universe, parallel universe, and then they come back. So they're in the same spot, but like they are not there, right? Physically, and then if you eat their food, then you might not be able to come back. So that reminds me a lot of like fairies, ah, uh, tapi datuk a spirit. Um, then I'll talk a bit about like experts, uh, who are the bomo, or they're also known as uh, bomo is translated translated as um a healer or shaman, a medicine man, and then orang pandai literally smart person. <laughs> so they. They, have, they know certain spells and they're orang baca-baca, which literally means the person who recites or who reads. Um, this refers to people who know like how to, they know certain spells or they know uh, Quranic verses. Some sacred, uh, next sacred sites uh, such as Karamat, which is the grave of a usually pious person. Or a makam, uh, which is also a grave. I'm not sure what the difference is actually. Okay, anyway, uh, objects such as the tangkal or azimat, in English we would call it charms. And also there are certain superstitious times um, of the year, of the month, of the week uh, that we often, the, these things often circulate in our cultural discourse. So for example, some of the pantang that uh, we talk about in Singapore is uh, to knock on the door before you enter a hotel room because there could be someone in there I mean some spirit uh, saying excuse me if you walk past the grave or if you uh, you know you go under a tree outside and you have to relieve yourself and you say excuse me 
in case again there's some spirit there um don't look at trees at night because you know there could be a cheap phone in the tree uh, don't respond to name to your name being called at night uh, because this can be an entity that is mimicking um someone you know uh, I don't know. I mean, by the way, I don't know all the consequences to like doing this. <laughs> maybe you'll be cursed or maybe some bad luck will fall upon you. <laughs> uh, washing your feet before entering a home after going to a funeral. So it means after going to a cemetery or if you witness an accident. Uh, again, this is like to avoid any of the lingering spirits uh, going home with you. Don't mention any scent of Frangipani. So... I mean, it's kind of sad. I feel like, you know, I like the frangipani flower. In Malay, it's the bunga chimpaka uh, or is it bunga kemboja? Kemboja, I think. Uh, like, you know, so it's like the poor flower has been associated with cemeteries and ghosts and funerals. And finally, be wary of any uh, second-hand items or money dropped on the floor because it could be, you know, uh, it, there was some intention uh, for it that you may not be aware of. So first, let's look at magic, or in Malay, we call it see here. So there is the the good kind, the good kind, the right white magic. Um, of course, it's good to the person who is casting it, but maybe it's not good to the receipt to the receiver because you are basically forcing them to to do or be something that they are not right that they don't want to do. So the first one, um, um, a friend told me this one. Uh, my parents used to tell us to baca tiga kul and blow in the direction of the driving instructor before a test. So this is something that was taught to her by her parents to get what you want. So in this case, she wanted to pass her driving test, right? So uh, tiga kul is, it refers to three short surahs of the Quran. Uh, and usually as children, like we learn, we first learn, we learn to memorize Al-Fatiha and then we learn the three kuls. And... Um, you know, in our cultural archive, like this cool is very protective in nature. Uh, in this case, it can also be used to get what you want. So you uh, blow in the direction of the person that you want something from. So it can also be, be someone, it could be your boss and you want a promotion. So you can do this. <laughs> okay, second is a spell or jumpy uh, that uh, was told to me by an interlocutor from um, Penyangat Island. So it goes... Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya Ali Bangida Ali. Sari-sari gajah berlenggang. Sah aku harimau jantan. Jauh berhawa dekat padam. Hawanya. Name the person that you want to influence. Pada ku. And then state what you wish to achieve. Berkat doa la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. So translated it will be in the name of Allah. Um, o Ali. Um, the way the elephant walks. Um, I am a male tiger. Um... Uh, with a uh, flame far away, but then it doesn't, but then, I don't know, it, it extinguishes when it's nearby. Um, so then you state what you want. And then at the end, it says, uh, with the blessings of this application, there is no God but God, and uh, Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. So here we can see a combination of dua, supplication, and uh, using the shahada, and then also uh, what seems to be like this pre-Islamic um, Malay jampi, like a chant. So that's an example of how um, in Southeast Asia, the syncretic blending of religions and pre-world religion uh, beliefs, such as animism or Hinduism or Buddhism, uh, this is all mixed together in Southeast Asia today. Um, finally, I this is from a Facebook group called It Must Be The Hantu. So you guys can join that group or check it out. It's very interesting. Um, people in Singapore post all kinds of um, anecdotes from Singapore about Hantu. Um, I suspected that he had put obat pengasih, a love potion, into my food and my instincts told me to discard it. Um, so I remember also reading in Russell Lee's uh, ghost stories book, you know, about nasi kangkang. Nasi kangkang is... Um, uh, you can prepare rice. Usually it's a woman that does it. So she prepares rice and then she has to squat over it and then let like the, the, the condensation, let the steam of the rice condense on her thighs and then to feed that rice to the man that she wants to fall in love with her. Uh, so that's, that is a one form of love potion. This is another form from this uh, Facebook group. 
Okay, that's also, um, yeah, these are considered white magic because it doesn't involve like hurting people, right? It's just like you want love or you want certain favors uh, and you want success in your life. And then we have black magic, which it, the intention is to injure someone, to destroy them or to take revenge. So uh, an associated phrase that we use is hanta barang, literally send things. And this, uh, these two are from the Facebook group, I think. Yeah. So someone sent a... Uh, Posted a picture of this. Uh, you can see it's like a plastic stool. And then there's like paper dolls of a man and a woman um, and two lines with a nail stuck through them. So the post says, is my neighbor trying to curse us? This is placed right under our window and they are claiming that it's for feng shui. Paper figures of a man and woman with a miniature coffin between them strapped together with a yellow ribbon that is covered with chants. Two green fruits on the side with a nail pierced through them. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, it's, it's kind of good, right? That they have a Facebook group to post these things because uh, clearly it's not a common site. People can see this and they know it's not it's not an, an offering. Um, okay, and then the next one, another one someone posted uh, that they found a strange letter with no address or name it contains a photo of a girl, hair, and some other items. This girl, the photo of this girl, uh, this girl's living next door to them. The items is actually for black magic purposes and must have been sent to them by mistake. So again, um, this kind of black magic, um, they would need something personal from the pers uh, from the target person. All right, now this is what, um, these are some two ways that is believed to help businesses prosper. So uh, known as Polaris or Peng Laris. So Laris in Malay means like brisk business. So the first kind, the not so scary kind is known as the Ai Anugera or the Ai Baca Baca. Literally the, the water with Anugera is like an a prize or award awarded water or the water with readings on it. Uh, it's quite cheap, only two dollars. And then what my interlocutor said, uh, my interlocutor uh, grew up working in a food stall, a Malay food stall. So the advice given to them by the the orang pandai, the smart person who does this baca baca or readings was to use the water to wipe the showcase glass. And then at the end of the day, after they mop the floor, um, to sprinkle some of this water on the floor to kind of help um, make the business prosper. And the second kind of Polaris is the scary kind, the hantu kind, which is a ghost that uh, the I presume the owner of the business would keep. And then this ghost will do something to the food. And then when people eat the food, then they'll be hooked. And as we know, you know, there's this famous... Um, stall in uh in Changi village right you know people say that stall is all the they, they say that they see the queues are so long and then people with a third eye they can see that there are entities holding the hands of the people uh, queuing up to buy the food uh this one is from a film called the tenggelamnya kapal van der Weyck, which is an indonesian film i think you might be able to watch it on youtube so these are spills from the movie. Okay, jinn. Um, in Malay Muslim belief, uh, jinn are like entities which uh, have many qualities similar to humans. So for example, they can be good, they can be bad, they can have different religions, they are different races. Um, so in this case, this man posted uh, his, his experience in the Hantu group. I mean, in the Facebook group called It Must Be Done Too, um, that he was at a mosque and then he thought there was somebody praying uh, behind him. In fact, he was the imam for that prayer. And then when the prayer was um, finished, he looked at him and there was, there was no one there. But I guess in this case, you know, the jinn is not, if, you know, whatever he felt or whatever entity was there, he's not really a nefarious being because he was just there to pray with, uh, with this guy. Okay, Tabi Dato. Uh, it's a kind of spirit, I guess. I, I don't find any relation to this in like the Islamic uh discourse. So it's more of a perhaps a Malay like pre-Islamic um, belief because it seems to be more like a ancestor worship or a kind of nature spirit. Because okay, Tabi Dato supposedly comes down to earth when 
during um a hot shower so like it's a rain it's a hot day but then the rain comes down uh so this is uh, my interlocutor from Penangan Island was taught this spell to recite when it uh when this kind of weather phenomenon occurs it says tabik datu anak cucu numpang lewat kalau ada apa-apa minta ubatkan kalau ada salah mohon dimaafkan so um like respect to my ancestor your grandchild is passing through if there is anything please help me to heal it if i have did if i have done anything wrong then please help to forgive it Okay, Makam Habib No. Uh, this is the grave of a Muslim saint which is found in Masjid Haji Muhammad Saleh. Uh, it's very popular among the uh, local Malay, commun Malay Muslim community. But I guess also just Muslim community. It's not just Malays that go there. Um, there's often a lot of events that um, go on at this mosque uh, related to Habib No. And this uh, one of my interlocutors uh, send me this quote. My mom used to send pulut kuning to Makam Habib No as an offering when she got hajat. I told her, kenapa ni macam Cina kasi offering? This one is okay. Uh, the mother said, this one is okay. Ni nak sedekah kasi orang makan. So to translate, um, pulut kuning is a sticky uh, yellow rice. Like it's yellow because of turmeric. And in um, Malay culture, um, this kind of rice is usually cook for celebrations, so for weddings or for birthdays. Um, so in this case, yeah, this celebratory kind of rice was um, sent to Makam Habib No um, when the mother had hajat. Hajat is like uh, a desire to for something, for some kind of outcome, kind of positive outcome. Um, and my interlocutor, who at this time was a teenager, said that, you know, she saw she, her perspective was that this looked like a Chinese offering. Um, but then, you know, the mother said, no, this it, it does, it's not, it looks like that, but it's not really uh, about that. This is to donate to other people to eat. It's like a charitable donation. So it's not the same as a Chinese offering. So you see, like, there's some distancing, right? Even though it looks similar, uh, this is not an offering, but this is a donation. So it's okay from the Muslim perspective. This is a picture of the, uh, the makam. This is another uh, ramad in Dapsen Plain Park. I've not been here, um, but you can read more on this website. Um, but apparently the, the family of this woman claims that there's not actually any um, remains of a body in this uh, grave. Although you do see people putting offerings there, right? You can see flowers. You can see like bouquets of flowers. You can see garlands. Um, it looks like there's also an upturned clay pot put there. Uh, so... Yeah, and so something on the left, maybe with joysticks um, under the tree. Here's another makam, uh, that of Putri Radin Mas Ayu or Kramat Radin Mas. I've been to this one personally. Okay, so Radin Mas Ayu was a 16th, 16th century Javanese princess. And the interesting thing is that she has two titles. So Putri is a title for a woman and Radin is a title for a man. So I, I don't, um I can't remember why she has two titles. Um. <clears throat> uh, but you can find the story in the Sejarah Melayu, <laughs> this very old manuscript. Um, you can read more as well at the website. And I remember at this karamat, I saw a posters from Mu'is about like, would have been like 8 to 10 pages that were laminated. It's like a letter or report written by Mu'is about the proper behavior at the gravesite. So this was uh, laminated and put up at the makam um, by the person who cares for this uh, makam. Um, so here we can see, you know, some regulation by the state in the form of Mu'is um, trying to control the belief of of the people. Um, you know, you should not be putting offerings at the makam, the proper behavior according to uh, this version of Islam is that the, the only the only thing you're allowed to do at a, at, a, at someone's uh, grave is to make prayers for them and to kind of maybe silently um how do you say like uh silently like reflect upon yourself. 
Um, and you can see, I, I do remember when I was there, I did see a flower pot and there were joss, joss sticks inside. So people are making offerings there. Despite what Mo is this. Okay, next one, Kramat Kusu on Kusu Island. I've been here as well. And I remember at the time, I didn't know anything about Kramat. Uh, so it was really like, it was really, um, I was very awed and very surprised. And I was just like, wow, this is like a mix of everything. Um, it has like Chinese influence. It has Muslim influence. It seems to have this like pre-Islamic um, influence also. So basically what you see is, is the graves of two... I think there's three graves. Um, but here I think we only see we only see two: the grave of the mother, Nenek Galib, and the daughter, Putri Fatima. Um, here, so you see on top of um like that hole that looks like a mosque, right? It says Nenek Galib, Keramat Kusu, Datuk Nenek. So Datuk Nenek is like a term that just means ancestor. So here we see is kind of the influence of that Chinese ancestor worship. Um, but the graves inside. They are they look totally normal, like any Muslim grave. You know, you have like the Batu Nisan, the two gravestones, and then they were wrapped in yellow cloth, which uh signify that they were of a noble lineage. And here you can see there's like a on the ledge, you see like a bottle. I I think is that alcohol? Like an offering, or it could be rose water, uh, to sprinkle on the grave. Then you see joysticks. You have a lot of ash around it. And on the right side, you see you get more joysticks, ash, and you see like flowers, flower bouquets being put there as well. And then in, if you kind of go in that corridor, then there's two framed um, pictures. I think one says Allah and one says Muhammad. So inside, it's, it seems very Muslim, but then outside, you see this totally yellow temple and this you know, people write, it, the yellow goes all the way down the hill. Like the floor is painted yellow, if I remember correctly, the sides of the walls. And people write there, like their hajat. So what they want to achieve, they write down body numbers, toto. Um, those that have achieved their hajat, they will write, I I pass my exams, I, I, whatever. <laughs> I don't want to be rich, I want to be successful. Um, okay, so then someone uh, said that this is how it works, right? My late mom told me, one who berniat hajat sesuatu atas keramat, if you have a certain desire that you want to, a certain outcome you want from asking this uh, this saint, you'll have a piece of yellow cloth tied around the hand from this uh, keramat. After obtaining the hajat, the cloth must be returned to Kusu Island and tied to a tree branch near keramat. So you can try that if you want. All right. So when people are sending all these black magic, white magic, uh, what are the well, usually black magic? Uh, what are some of the ways that you can protect yourself? So one person said it's uh Surah Al Baqarah, um, verse two five five is the best weapon against any kind of um negative entities. Another way is a physical charm called a tangkal. Uh. In the money pot, there's a Quran. Oh, okay, this is from an interlocutor who worked in the food business. She said, in the money pot, there's a Quran wrapped in leather. Ada orang pandai dah kasih blessings. And it also works as, uh, this, you know, the, the expert gave uh, blessings on this Quran. And also pelaris and also protection for the money. Maybe against Toyo. Uh, so the Quran wrapped in the leather put in the money pot where they get cash from the customers. Um, has many functions, right? It, it helps make great business um, more successful and then it also protects against Toyo, you know, which they come to steal money. So I guess when the Toyo comes and they see the Quran, then they are scared of. Um, uh, another physical object is the is a winter melon. So my interlocutor said that they, they in her family stall, they will put a winter melon on the shelf. If it bursts, that means somebody has sent a spell. Um, but she herself said, you know, itu kan buah, mestilah satu hari dia akan busuk. This is a fruit, a fresh fruit. So surely one day it will rot. So maybe when it bursts, is it just because of uh, natural causes or did somebody really send something? Another person from the Facebook group said, uh, rock salt around the perimeter of the house and recite Salawat Nabi. Start from the front door and work clockwise. If the entity is from outside, God willing, it will not come in. So this also, you know, it's, 
seems very like Western to me, the kind of use of salt against um, devils or demons. Uh, this, these photos are from a blog by someone who I think calls himself a bomo um, or an expert. And he, what he does is that if, I think these are usually like negative um, charms or that people receive. Sometimes they may come back and unwittingly find such things in their bag or whatever. And then his job is to disenchant them. So like remove the spell from them. And as you can see, you know, these physical objects can be all kinds of, could be anything. Uh, it could be like a bowl of garlic, uh, joysticks, um, you know, that looks like dried sea horses. And then on the left, we see some glass bottles with um, animal parts in them. Looks like wires or some kind of, um, I don't know, insect or threads. And then it's wrapped in leather, it's wrapped in cloth. Um, on the left, you can see there's uh, papers with spells written on them and they put it in like a tube and then again, wrap in the yellow cloth um, foil to, and they would like, you you know, either this charm would be used to put on somebody's person or to keep somewhere. You can see the picture on the left, you have um, a diagram, like a diagram of a human body. So it's possible that, you know, perhaps this was some kind of spell to cause illness upon someone. And then you see the middle picture is like a diagram. This could be some kind of numerology. That's the spell. And on the right side, you have more writing um, in Arabic letters. Uh, but it looks like the language is Malay. So I don't know, it looks really old. It could be photocopied from older sources. And on the right, we see a, a form of tanka. So you see that roll of money is tied with rubber bands around the charm, the physical object that is used to protect the money pot. Okay, so what are these, you know, what is the hantu used to explain what kind of phenomena? Um, okay, so I'll share that when I was young, um, I experienced having a bomo come to our house. I think I was, would I have been six or seven years old? Um, and this bomo, you know, claimed well, he claimed he could cure my sister. Uh, my sister has a form of muscular dystrophy. Uh, and he actually physically beat the body of my sister. And my sister did cry out. So she, it, he really did it, you know, so it, it hurt. And she has uh, since said in adulthood that she actually dissociated during the event. Um and then I remember, you know, he beat her and he spat out like some kind of flesh. And you know, now I'm thinking about it as an adult, and I was talking about it with my sister. And we're thinking like he didn't really like I mean he he beat her, but he didn't um hurt her. He didn't like remove flesh from her body, right? So what was that thing? Maybe it was like raw chicken or something, but you know, there's this I there's this idea like he needs to be dramatic enough to show like whatever he's doing is is effective. Um another anecdote that I would share is um, where I had there was a family member who had schizophrenia in my family, and her behavior, her erratic behavior, used to be explained by possession. So, I think it's probably still common that you know people with mental health conditions, uh, a lot of things are explained by uh, possession by some hantu. And um, yeah. Okay, so this is the Facebook group where I got um, a lot of the, the sources from this presentation from. So I hope you guys can check it out because it's quite fun. And I will um, see you guys in the next presentation. So let me know what you want me to talk about. I can talk about my research or fun side projects like this. All right, see you guys in the next video.